listening to the domestiques on planet earth on this sunday july the 3rd this is episode two of a brand new podcast series where we bring you all there is to bring you as the world's biggest bike race la tour de france continues on its merry way i am michael tobolaros coming you coming to you from the lands of the darawal country where i pay my respects to the first nations elders past and present and joining me from New Zealand, where she has been located for the last few days, is Aussie elite champion Matilda Reynolds, a rider of the highest quality. But may I add, a person whose skills on the bike are matched by her charm, her intelligence, and articulation as a human being. Tills, welcome. Oh. Did you like? Did you like that intro? Mike. Mike, what you, a rap. you uh, blow me up a bit too much there. You, you're delivering the world, and I think I'll give an atlas. But um. Yeah, I'm feeling much, much fresher for this podcast. Not to, I was a former triathlete, so it's only natural I give an early excuse. But um, yeah, I was just off a 32 hour flight with food poisoning last time. Oh. So felt like I'd been dragged behind a four by four through the fields of Gallipoli. So feeling much <laughs> fresher today and yeah, excited to talk about what's been happening already in the early stages of, of racing with the men's and women's. So yeah. All right. Well, here. good. Good to see that you're looking good and hold those thoughts because uh, the Domex Sticks just would not be the same without the big, bold personality of Lee Hollywood Turner. <laughs> Welcome to you, Hollywood, to tell us uh, where are you on this big blue planet of ours? Uh, thank you, Mike, and welcome to Matilda as well. I am currently in Mykonos. I arrived uh, today. Alison and I arrived today, so I'm sitting on my balcony with the ocean behind me, and it's uh, beautiful here, 25 degrees tonight, and it's beautiful. Great, great. Uh, Hollywood, I have to ask you, Lee Turner, how did you get the name Hollywood? Uh, when I first started riding maybe 20 plus years ago, I used to go to a bike shop in Chelsea, Mainline Cycles, and I used to always like the flashy, nice stuff and dress immaculate. And Warren Brook, the owner's brother, said, you're so Hollywood, and it just stuck. Okay. It's uh, it's very apt, I can tell you that. Well, it seems uh, we have received some positive feedback from episode one of The Domestics. Let's see if we can make it a successful double with episode two. Coming up very soon, uh, we will introduce to you the king of cuisine, a man who has cooked his way through France for more than 10 years with Taste Latour. Yes, it's Gabriel Gatte. Monsieur Gatte will join us imminently. But first up, uh, let's have a look at what's happened overnight and so far in the world's greatest bike race, Le Tour de France. Stage two was completed and uh, it was the first of the open road stages as the big bike race uh, continues on its journey through the host nation for the Grand Depart Denmark. Uh, Tills, uh, you had a good look at the stage or the stages so far. What do you make of the race so far? Yeah, I think it's been, um, it, it's certainly not been without drama. We've obviously had, so we've had the prologue and then um, and then the sprint stage overnight. Uh, and, and the prologue, uh, there wasn't too many um, drastic surprises, but uh, everyone would say that the winner ended up being a bit of a surprise and even Lampart. Um, he, he's a very, very capable TT specialist, but just was never really picked as to win that stage. But I think um, a bit of the conditions played into into the factors there. Um, so, yeah, even Lampard of, of Quick Step obviously came away with the yellow jersey and a very early uh, win for uh, Quick Step. Um, they would have been and, and unexpected, I think, uh, and pretty much just puts all our podcast experts on par that absolutely no one picked him and no one's really got any idea. So, and then, the, you know, a few little um, things that came from the prologue, um, you know, Thomas, despite wearing a gilet throughout his uh, TT, which, you know, these, these teams spend thousands and thousands of dollars uh, to be the most aero possible. And, and Thomas went and put a pretty much a parachute on the back of him, but did still rode quite well, didn't lose too much time. 
But I think just the weather played an enormous part in in uh, yesterday's prologue. Everyone was taking it a little bit easier um, and just trying not to come down and 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 sort of stay within the guardrails. So um, yeah, not too many losses or, or or huge gains. It is my man Ben O'Connor actually lost a minute, um, so that is hard. Like coming into a tour and you're already a minute behind. Um, I'm hoping they'll let him go up the road at some point, but then. More excitingly, um, you know, last night's sprint, I I would recommend it's probably a stage that you just watch the highlights of. Uh, I think, you know, you probably probably grasp it in in sort of 10, 15 minutes, but it was an easy breakaway that went marred by a few crashes and just a very, very hectic sprint finish. Um, You know, a lot, a huge washing machine, very narrow roads. They went across this bridge, which ended up not being as... You know, it was a bit hyped up more than it needed to be. It wasn't as windy as they thought. It was a bit more of a headwind. Um, but yeah, at, uh, Jakobsen, Fabio Jakobsen came away with the win. Spoiler alert, sorry. Um, and I think this this is an amazing story, and that's what I love in cycling is the stories that come out of it. But, it, it you know, the quick step story was a little bit marred by not taking Cavendish. But Fabio Jakobsen, two years ago, almost lost his life in Poland. I've never... Don't rewatch it. You know, it was the most horrific crash um, that, you know, has probably been in professional cycling. It was shocking and huge amounts of reconstruction to his face, to his body. So for him to come back and to win his first stage of the Tour de France is just extremely exciting. And I think um, an absolute credit to him and his journey um, on the way back. Few things that came out of that. Caleb Ewan looked amazing. He won the first um, intermediate sprint, but just did not have any clear way. Absolutely, his his team absolutely deserted him. He wasn't. If he can get a clear run of road, he'll, he'll he he will get up for a win. And then also good to see Sargon fighting back. If you do get the opportunity, have a look at the last sort of hundred meters where Fabio and um, and Peter Sargon come. Uh, they clash. They touch. And uh, Jakobsen gets it over Sagan, which I just think blows my mind for someone to have had such a horrific crash to still put himself in that position, um, in, in that sort of life-threatening position in that, in you know, going 60 kilometers an hour rubbing shoulders is, um, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. So, yeah, it's worth watching the last few hundred meters. But, yeah, not too many mm. major winners or losers yet, um, certainly Podjakar and uh, and a lot of the GC riders are in a in in a good position, um, and yeah, there's a long long way to go. It sure is, Hollywood. What are your early observations? Oh well, I didn't see any of the prologue because I was in air, but I did watch today live. I watched it all and watched the replay of the finish many times. It was I loved the finish. It was like. It was rubbing shoulders, Sagan, and um, he nearly came off because they were leaning. It was so exciting. And then when uh, Jacobson just went bang and just went away from Sagan and just – I thought, wow, it was going to win. It. I was so excited. My man crush was going to win. And then on the throw, the quick step rider got it. But what I did notice was, as of now still, Cavendish has not Instagrammed and said well done to either of his two teammates that have won the first or second stage. So he's said nothing. So that sort of is something in itself. So what are you saying? Um, sour grapes from Cav? He's, yeah, he's soaking up. He's soaking up for sure. Okay. You'd think, well, you know, you, you would think like if Mark you're... Cav. Yeah, but you've got to think if you were, you know, your teammates, you're playing footy and your teammates played in the grand final and, and won, you would congratulate them all. They played in the final and won, you congratulate. He said nothing. That speaks volumes. He's sucking. Fair enough, though, but well, he's sucking. That's not like Mark Cavendish. He's a, it's not like Mark Cavendish. He's a very uh, highly respectable person who always um, um, acknowledges his teammates, whether he's there or not. Exactly. I'm being quite... I'm being quite flippant. Well, that's uh, two days <laughs> oh. out of the way, and we've got uh, day three coming up. We'll talk more about that a little bit later on. You're listening to The Domestics. The Domestics by Black Sheep Cycling. Yes, you are listening to The Domestics. It's powered by Black Sheep, Australia's premier cycling apparel brand. Now, have you noticed, uh, Tills and uh, Hollywood, that I do pronounce it Domestics? Um, the voiceover guy who puts the sting together it calls it domestics now now according to my research a domestic is a rider who works for the benefit of their of their team leader rather than trying to win a race 
him or herself. I'm not going to pronounce it domestic because it sounds more like a bathroom cleaning uh, detergent, but I oh, will... Oh, domestos. domestos. Um, I will ask... Well, that's right. That's the same thing. But I will ask our man on the scene who uh, needs no introduction, who knows better than I do, and I'm talking about... Uh, a man who is a native Frenchman. He's from the city of Angers in the Loire Valley. He's educated Australians about the French cuisine for more than 40 years. Uh, let's see if Gabriel Gatte can lighten up on the pronunciation on the title of this program. Bonjour, Gabriel. Bonjour, and today I am a domestic. Correct. <laughs> and as, as a chef, I am a domestic too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's uh, great that I know that I am pronouncing it correctly, domestic. Thank you, Gabriel. And it's so good to have you yeah. on uh, the program. Um, you are so familiar with many of us who have uh, followed your Tour de France journey. But prior to that, of course, uh, you were uh, on the scene in Australian television going back, what, back to the late 1970s? Am I right? Yes, I, I did my first uh cooking segment regularly in 1978 mm. in Adelaide. Wow. So it's many years ago, and I've been a chef for 51 years. Uh, Gabriel, what you have done is you've brought cooking, cuisine, French cuisine, aligned with cycling. Did you ever think in your wildest dream cycling and uh, cuisine would ever go hand in hand? Yes, because um, each time I go for a ride, I want to have a good feed after that. <laughs> So, <laughs> um, well, when I was watching, uh, you know, the Tour de France, uh, you know, 30 years ago on SBS, um, I thought um, it would be nice to add a cultural segment to it. And, um, you know, I kept bumping into Les Marais in studios and we, we had a little chat, mostly about soccer, actually, uh, or football. And, he, uh, and at one day I said, no, it would be nice to add just a, a segment at the beginning of the, the coverage about, you know, the place, about what people eat, because that's what we think of, uh, you know, when I'm looking at the map of the, of the tour this year, you know, I, I can see that after, you know, I, I was thinking of De Denmark, I was thinking of Calais, you know, where there's com going to be some amazing fish, and then after that, you know, the, the Lorraine region, on the quiche Lorraine, and, and so many of the specialties. That's the way the, the French people think. You know, if it goes to cognac, we think of cognac. We know the specialties of the region. And for us, the French people, it means a lot, the regions and what they provide that is different. And France is, is just amazing. France is, is the most, uh, you know, complete country in terms of variety within a, a short distance. Mm. Yes, it sure is. I can tell you personally that you've educated me uh, about uh, the array of uh, cuisine that is available throughout the country. And I think you've done the same with many Australians. What sort of feedback do you receive about your segments on a uh, program like the Tour de France? Well, to, all together, we did it for 15 years. The first few years were, were all recorded in Australia because there was no budget for it and it became popular but at the beginning as you know there was a little bit of from the cyclists from the fanatics in in uh, not from the domestic but from the fanatic <laughs> <laughs> a little resistance because they probably thought that that cookery segment was taking away a little bit of the cycling where actually it wasn't it was just before sbs was getting the rest life to air and um at the beginning, there was a bit of resistance from the cyclists. But then uh, what Les Marie told me is that actually the, it increased enormously the number of people that were not, uh, you know, fanatics of the sport, but just enjoy watching the images and the culture. We see it on the helicopter shots. And, and suddenly, um, I think the first year, the ratings, but you never know from one year to another, uh, had increased like 15 or 20 percent, which is very, uh, you know, significant. So Les was very happy. I think that slowly people realized that um, if they didn't want to watch me talking about the food of a region, they could always go and um, jump in the, no, sorry, make themselves a cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and then slowly it uh, people started to to like mm. it very much actually and, and we got very good feedback. Gabriel, I can tell you from a personal perspective that when uh, the head of sport at the time, Les Murray, said to me 
Uh, Tomo, we're going to introduce a, a cuisine section in the Tour de France coverage. This is going back to, what, 2004, 2005. I said, Les, yeah. what are you doing? This is a sporting event. They push pedals. They're going through uh, the, one of the most beautiful countries in the world. You cannot uh, mix c- cooking, cuisine with uh, cycling. And I'll put my hand up now. Uh, I was definitely wrong because what the Tour de France coverage in Australia, and I think it's unique to Australia, has I- done is it uh, has attracted different layers of audience. Different people watch the coverage of the tour for different reasons sure there is the pushing of pedals and there are those who are who are hardcore cycling um, people they just want to watch the sport but there are many others who watch it for different reasons and i think your segment proved that do you agree uh, completely and i was watching it for other reasons myself I, I, i've always loved cycling I, I was lucky to to see eddie Merckx in uh, on the side of the road you know when i was a kid uh, so we would go to see the Tour de France, uh, you know, wherever it went in, in our region. We would, we would cycle to the Tour de France <laughs> um, if the Tour de France was not coming to us. But, uh, you know, you know as a presenter that you, you had that book uh, in front of you telling you this is the Chateau de Beaupro. Uh, you know, it was built in the, in the 11th century on the such and such king and... So you can see that already, you know, you could see uh, already at the time with the images that that people were watching it for something else. But when um, I talked to Les about about it, uh, he said, you know, Gabriel, we, we do sport. He told me that we do sport. We don't do cooking. And he asked me actually to produce the show because he felt that the department, and it was right, didn't have the expertise of, of knowing, you know, the, the camera work with with food, the, the type of presentation and things like that. So actually, we, after showing a pilot, we did a pilot on the Loire Valley. Uh, I, I remember cooking a dish of salmon and a sauce with it, and the you know, SBS liked it. And then it was, from that time, it was, um, you know, on. It was I was nervous, of course, at the beginning. Um, but we quickly uh, warmed to it, and I think the audience did. And... What a privilege to go in all the regions of France, you know, each year, not, not all the regions. This year, it's mostly the, the east of France and the north and, and, of course, the Pyrenees. But, you know, France is amazing. France, the beauty of France, the, the flavor, the smell of France, the variety between the, the Alps, where, you, you know, you look forward to, uh, to have some amazing cheeses to... Uh, to Brittany or, or you know Calais, where you, the seafood platters are just mm. amazing, and the different wines in each region—it's it's just so rich. Mm. Hollywood, I have this image of you uh, in a living in a small village in France, uh, pushing your bike with a piece of uh, well, a piece of cheese in the in the front basket, and maybe a a, a long bread coming out of the of your back pocket. Uh, <laughs> but you're in Mykonos right now, where the seafood I would imagine is quite exceptional. Um, but well, what do you make of Gabriel and the fact that he has educated us through his cuisine on a cycling event very good but i have to confess my favorite one he ever did was the tour de frankston gabrielle i I know that i've certainly grown up with um yeah your your dulcet tones just remind me of sort of yeah growing up and watching Watching the Tour de France, um, but and I've never I've never sounded more bogan or ochre. I feel like when I'm in the same same room as uh, as you. But I wanted to ask you, like, what it, what would you say was your best and worst culinary experience? Well, I remember actually it was a bit of I think I was set up. We were filming in Central Australia, and we were filming some goanna being cooked um, on the, on the fire. And the guy that was, we are talking uh, 1986, I did a, a show for ABC called The Good Food Show. It was actually uh, recorded on film. It was done on film at, still at that time. And the guy, uh, you know, because I was on camera, he gave me the liver of the goanna. And it was so, you know, like it was bitter. It was, it was uneatable. And of course, on camera, you are given something and, you know, it says, so what do you think? I said, oh, this is delicious. <laughs> and then as soon as you're off to where you, you spit it. And I remember still, the, as talking to you, I remember still the flavor 
of that disgusting <laughs> part of the liver, but the rest of the goanna was delicious. Yes. And Mathilda, I must tell you that the, the French soldiers um, in the north of France, when they were next to the Australian soldiers, they were hearing uh, what's in Matilda, and they created a French version of what's in Matilda in French that became very popular with Yves Montand uh, during the, the Second War. Ah, there's a bit of a... I, I just love well, the way he says my name. I was just going to have it on <laughs> ASMR, just had a repeat. <laughs> Matilda, <laughs> bonjour. What about the crowd on the side of the road last night? Yeah, the... yeah in stage two, it was quite brilliant. The Danes uh, love their cycling, uh, Gabriel, and uh, they've come out in uh, in their, well, millions, I would, I would I would suspect. But look, tell me, yes. uh, as a result of your involvement with the Tour de France, you also ride a bicycle. And I can tell you, Tills, that I've got this idea to make a series with Gabriel in the future. It's it's in the back of my mind. It's called, uh, it will be will be called, I would suspect, uh, the the cyclist and the chef. Now, Gabriel will be the cyclist and I will be the chef. <laughs> oh, mon Dieu. <laughs> it's got gold written all yes, over well, it, Gabriel. It is. No, no, it, it is definitely comedy. We will get the logis for the most innovative comedy. <laughs> Look, Gabriel, it's uh, really wonderful to have you on the Domestics and thank you for uh, educating us on the correct pronunciation of the title of this show. You are an institution. You have taught me so much, and I suspect many of uh, the listeners oh, and you, viewers Mike. who have followed your career over the last, uh, well, 40-odd 40, 40 years. Thank you, sir. Merci beaucoup. Thank you, guys. Hey, Gabriel, we've, yes. got, a fr we've got a French uh, board of directors, and I think I have to go to France later this year, for the, excitingly, for the Tour de l'Avenir. I'm just trying to work out oh, what, is, what is the do's and don'ts of uh, how, how do you piss a French person off and, and how, do you, how do you get them on side? What's the do's and don'ts with the French? Well, the, the rule number one is that when you meet someone, you don't say, excuse me, where's the, the road to, uh, you know, the, the station? You say, bonjour, monsieur, bonjour, madame. You really need okay. to greet. Because in, in Australia, we say, excuse me, uh, you know, do you know where the station is? Uh, so, greet, bonjour monsieur, bonjour madame, uh, and, and the fact that you have said a couple of words in French, that, that shows that you have made a, an effort, and then after that, uh, it will be helpful. Of course, if, uh, do you speak any French? No, Matilda? I'm going to have to um, go pretty hard no. on the Duolingo. So, so uh, you will see that, uh, ask the young people, because practically everybody, like my nephews and nieces, they speak English better than me <laughs> because they because they've traveled a lot more when they were very young. Uh, so you ask a young person, and you will see uh, you, you'll be fine. If you look for a, re a restaurant or something, ask the chemist because they are educated and they they know everybody. You go to the chemist, ask rather than uh, you know another cafe yeah. or or someone in the street that kind of thing. And uh, yeah, just say, uh, greet. It's really important. Gabrielle, having known you for as long as I have, uh, you do a party trick, and that is uh, reproducing an Australian accent uh, through your <laughs> French. Now, can you give us an example, please? Was in Matilda, was in Matilda, good day, love, how are you? Uh, well, lovely talking to you. Well, you. You know what that sounds like? That sounds like a Frenchman putting on an Aussie accent, trying to put on a French I'm accent. I reckon too. <laughs> <laughs> You're taking the piece. <laughs> this is The Domestics, presented by Black Sheep Cycling. Look, we've lost Hollywood for the time being, so you can be our new Hollywood, uh, Gabriel, and we'll keep you going until the end of the program. I have received notifications from listeners who have tuned into the domestics, and we do encourage you to contact uh, any of the team for subjects you may want to discuss. Sue Sharples is from Balnarring on Victoria's Morning Mornington Peninsula, and Sue has passed on a message to me. Sue says she'd like to hear more about the health benefits that cycling regularly offers. And she says, uh, belonging to a group benefit. I can tell you that cycling regularly is good for the body, is uh, good for the mind, and especially good for the soul. It's done me wonders over the last eight months. Uh, Matilda, what's your take on all of that? Oh, yeah, you never regret a bike ride unless you've gone over the hood of a car. Probably would have stayed in bed that day. But, 
No, I, th- I think I'd, I'd be on plenty of um, even more pills if I didn't have cycling. It's just amazing for your mental health. And uh, yeah, you always usually always find the answer or the solution you're looking for when you go out for a ride. So yeah, they're absolutely endless and, and made even better when you can find a group. So yeah, so make sure you, you find some friends, choose a coffee shop that you're going to go to after the ride. And uh, yeah, that's absolutely the best bit and, and ride safe out there. But yeah, all positives. Nothing. Very, very okay. grateful to have found the sport in the world. Absolutely. Gabrielle, what's your experience now with cycling? How often do you ride the bike? You live down at the Bellarine Peninsula in Victoria. Well, uh, uh, part-time, but I've always ridden because when we were kids, uh, we didn't have a car. So it was like going everywhere on the bike. Uh, I think you are, you are with, you know, with the moment when you ride, you, you know, you, first you're outside, you breathe some fresh air. I think that the fresh air, breathing, I think breathing is the key to health, really. Mm. Uh, you know, the, more than anything else, you breathe when you meditate, you know, you, you meditate on your breathing. Uh, outside, you, you have more chance to, you know, not to stop breathing or to, so you are with the moment, you have got to concentrate on what you do, you don't, uh, your, your mind is not so uh, negative. So I think that, um, yeah, riding is wonderful. Mm. It's just one of the best. And, and Tills, uh, I've been riding my bike now on a recreational level for about 20 years. And I'm beyond the point now where I, I'm, I'm actually sick of thrashing myself. Uh, and I've got to the stage where I'm thinking of jumping on an e-bike. Don't laugh. I'm thinking of jumping on an e-bike and purchasing a gravel bike. Um, look, I think e-bikes are the future if they're not already the present. And it's an opportunity for people from... A variety of backgrounds, whether they're fat or fit, to jump on two wheels and enjoy the thrill of the two wheel machine. Yeah, I'm one of the biggest uh, e bikes, uh, ch- you know, uh, supporters. Uh, in the, in the, you know, I absolutely, um, I think there's obviously huge amounts of benefits. But if anyone on this who's listening to this podcast hasn't tried an e bike, withhold your judgment of e bikes until mm, you've actually jumped absolutely. on one because. Yeah, I think the the most immediate thing is you can't wipe the smile off your face. It's like riding a bike for the first time as a kid, and and that's what you forget with with cycling and and fitness is that it should be a joy, and that's what e bikes brings, and it's just an amazing enabler. It enables you to tackle those hills or go further and farther than you, you know you ever thought before. So, absolutely, if you haven't haven't tried an e bike, go down to your local store, test ride one, then come back to us and let us know your feedback. But I I, I know you won't be disappointed. So yeah, highly encourage it, and then. Yeah, the other, obviously, the craze at the moment is is off-road, just really because of the safety, I think, is a massive, mm. massive element to that. But also just, again, the joy when you're not having to ride a bike and being concerned about cars or vehicles or, you know, life-threatening things and you can just be out there on a gravel road. That's really, again, where the true benefits of cycling come. And as Gabrielle said, it, it's a moving meditation you know, you can you can breathe out there deeply and it's, yeah, it's a beautiful sport. So highly recommend both both of those. Well, we have lost Hollywood. Uh, no great loss because we have picked up Gabriel Garte for the <laughs> final section <laughs> of the Domestics. Sorry, Hollywood. <laughs> uh, he's going to give me the guillotine next time I see well, he's, <laughs> he's gone for a look, bath. He, he's gone in the waters of, uh, of Yeah, Greece. that's exactly right. Look, the Tour de France completes its excursion into Denmark uh, for stage three before the first of three rest days this year. Um, Tills, what do you think will happen for stage three? Will the wind uh, make uh, an impact? Uh, it was a very quiet day wind-wise uh, for stage two. Denmark is a very flat country. What do you think might happen? Yeah, I think the, uh, I think uh, Jakobsen will be hard to beat because um, just when it is windy, that's really when quick step comes to the fore. And really, you know, we talk about whoever wins a lot, but really it's it's Murkoff who's the real winner at, at quick step. There's no better lead out man in the world than him. And he can lead whoever it is, whether it be Cavendish, Jakobsen, Bennett uh, last time. So, yeah, I think I think they'll be hard to beat. But if Caleb Ewan gets a free run and a little bit of space, then I think uh, then he'll be within with a really good chance. But, yeah, just hopefully not too many crashes. We saw a few, quite a few GC riders went down, and that's just hard. It's it's so hard to crash so early in a three-week three tour. No matter how soft it is, you're going to be sore, um, 
saw a lot of riders going over the bars, uh, even and even t- and and the other thing is um, the weather. So you're seeing a huge amount of flat tires happening in the peloton as well, which the Denmark roads are sort of known for. When they get wet, there's just an enormous amount of amount of flat. So hopefully everyone gets through unscathed and we see another fast, aggressive sprint uh, for, for the third stage. And hopefully everyone makes it out of Denmark. It'd be awful to do the Tour de France and never actually ride in France. So, yeah, hopefully um, hopefully get a clear stage. But I can I can see the party boy's back. He's just gone off, had a few cocktails. Hollywood's come back into the, into the peloton. Yes, good is. Hollywood, where are you? Where have you been? Did you take a dip no, in the I've Mediterranean been here the whole sea or time. What? I could hear everyone there. Oh. That's, that's, that's how reliable he yeah. is. That's, that's, that's the consistency <laughs> we should expect out of, um, All right. out of him. We'll wrap it up there. We've got to wrap it up there. Time has got the better of us. Gabriel, thank you so much for joining us and thank you for what you've done now on Australian television over the last 40-odd years. Tills, we'll do it all again uh, uh, after the rest day because uh, the cobbles of northern France are not far away. Thanks for joining us, Hollywood. Well, he's probably on his 15th tequila, I think, on the island of Mykonos. From the Domestiques, we'll talk to you soon. The Domestiques. The Domestiques by Black Sheep Cyclone.